right, so welcome to class number three, Discipleship 101. So as you learned in the last class, I've taught you how to do soul winning. So I hope that you wrote all of that down. So it will come in very, very handy. Be sure to make sure that you're familiar now. Uh, your homework assignment was to review it, so you should be familiar with it by now. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you the introduction on how to actually catch a person. Because even though you know how to do soul winning, the problem is how to introduce the topic to the person, right? So this is for people online too. Now with friends, it would be easier. But let's say there's a total stranger and you don't know how to talk to the person, right? So what I'd recommend is this, is that we always do two ministries. Or you can think about it as three ministries. So one is street preaching. I'll also put this as tracking. Sometimes if you can't preach on the streets or hold a sign, you can track. You can pass out tracks to people on the street. So pick a busy area nearby. If there's a downtown area or a busy spot that you can go to, go to that area and pass out tracks or do street preaching. And then uh, another one is door knocking. We also call this visitation. So basically you knock on doors. Now it depends on which one you're more comfortable with. I think this one will be more effective with practicing witnessing is to knock on doors. Because in this one, you just you have to find a spot where it's busy, where you can find people, and it seems a little bit more awkward to introduce a soul winning topic. Okay, so what you do is this, is that let's say that uh, you're door knocking. All you have to do is knock on the door, and then this is how you're going to introduce the topic, okay? So this one is methods to, of witnessing. These are methods of witnessing. Now, here's how you do introduction. Okay, how are you going to catch the person? Okay. You knock on the door. As soon as a person opens up the door, all you have to do is this. Hi. We're just going around the neighborhood. Now, who's we, right? If you're the only one. Let's say you're a person watching us online. You're the only person. We can represent our church. Okay? So you can represent our church. San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Even though you're not attending, you could say that uh, you're a member online, okay? The reason why we is important is because that way they don't see you as some strange, weird individual, as some stranger, but rather you're part of some kind of group of people who's going around the neighborhood. You want to give them that idea. We're just going around the neighborhood, passing out free comics. Now, why do I say passing out free comics? Because you're going to be using chick tracks. So, in the methods of witnessing, what we strongly recommend for the methods of witnessing is to buy chick tracks. Now, unfortunately, we cannot provide that to our online people. We only provide it for people who come to our church. As a matter of fact, we've had even visitors coming to our church, just visitors. They didn't come to, back to our church and they took as many Chick Tracks with them. So we fully welcome that. The reason why we recommend Chick Tracks, where you can buy them, is www.chick.com. And for our members, you're lucky, you just get it free from us. For those of you who don't have that access, order from www.chick.com. Here's another website which you ordered your books from www.kjv1611.org www.kjv1611.org I'm really sorry if I wrote this in small letters. I hope people online can see that. But the thing is, is that in these two websites, you can order Chick Tracks. The reason why I add this link as well, KJV1611, is because there's a lot other tracks you can buy as well, not just Chick Comic Tracks. But see, think about this. When you knock on a person's door and they open the door, and I go, hi, we're just going around the neighborhood passing out free comics. Here's one for you. What are you naturally going to do? You're going to take it, right? 
So that's why this is very effective. Now, before you say hi, you want to put this part in, okay? So I'm sorry I didn't put this part first, but after you say hi, you need to say this. So as not to scare you. Why? Because what is a person thinking? Yes. So as not to scare you, we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. or trying to sell you something. When you use these three things, it makes a person go, ah, oh, and they relax, and then they'll listen to the rest that you have to say. So usually people close the doors, they don't listen to you because they think that you're a Mormon Jehovah Witness or some kind of person trying to sell something. So you just want to simply tell them, so as not to scare, uh, hi, so as not to scare you, we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or trying to sell you something. And then after that, you say, we're just going around the neighborhood, passing out free comics. Here's one for you. So here's one for you. When you say that line, here's one for you, you're offering them the track. And guess what? They will receive it. Naturally, they will receive it. After they receive it, then what you do is that you just make things more comfortable. So that's the first part of the intro. The second part of the intro is that you say, so that we're not strangers. My name is Gene, or my name is Tony, my name is Chris, my name is Robert, etc. Why? Because you want to get familiar with them. What's your name? So number two, this is closure now, okay? Now you're doing closure. That way they can get comfortable with you. So that we're not strangers, my name is Gene. What's your name? And then, you know, shake hands. And then this is optional. So this part is optional. After you shake hands, the optional part is that you bring up some light conversation, bring up some other stuff after that. Like maybe there's something you saw in their house that's really nice. Or you saw some beautiful flowers in front of their porch, and you're like, oh, wow, that's a nice flower. What is that? And, you know, you might see their baby, and you go, oh, that's a beautiful baby. What's her name? What's his name? And then uh, maybe there's something beautiful in the house that they decorate, and you go, oh, wow, you know, I meant to make my house like this. It's a nice decoration. Light conversation, all right? Make some light conversation. Do a sort of a voice Yes. Oh, uh, the avoiding questions is in the middle of your witnessing, so I apologize. So in the middle of your witnessing is where you avoid questions. Thank you for bringing that up. Some people online were probably thinking about that. So here you can ask as many questions as you want. The point is, is that it depends on your character and personality. The Lord has blessed each and every one of you uh, with probably a gift to be able to socialize better, come up with words. So use that trait in you. If you're good at making friends, then use it as best as you can. So use whatever light conversation. Now you might say, well, I'm awkward. I'm not a person who socializes, so uh, I can't make light conversation. That's fine. That's optional, okay? I told you that's optional, so don't worry. It's optional. So don't worry about that. Now, you're a person who can't be good in conversation. 
or you want to jump to the next step after you gave them the optional live conversation. What you do is that after you save that so that we're not strangers, my name is what? What's your name? And shake hands. You know what I do? I either make light conversation, which is optional, or I jump to the question. All right. Just want to ask you, or I just want to ask you, a quick, okay, I'm going to put this in caps, a quick question. That way they don't feel like that, oh, this is not going to take a long, you know. Just want to ask you a quick question. Here's the question. This is where you draw in your soul winning. If you were to die today, and you may have heard me say this in the video gospel, which is why you got saved too, because this question caught the hook. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? I don't know if the people can see that at the bottom, so I'll just add this as best as I can. So notice, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? And put a little bit of stress on 100%. Are you 100% sure you go to heaven? Because when you do it that way, a person doesn't have to say, yeah, I think I can go to heaven when they're actually not. If you put it like 100% sure, a person would be more honest and say, no, I'm not saved. And that would give you a chance to actually witness to them. And then they're going to answer no. And after they answer no, boom, everything that you saw in the last class, you use it. So let me show you how this works at the intro. Hi, so as not to scare you, we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or trying to sell you something. We're just going around the neighborhood, passing out free comics, like to give one to you. Here you go. All right. Hey, so that we're not strangers, uh, my name's Gene. What's your name? All right, Sam. All right, Sam. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, Sam. Well, I'm not good at light conversation, so after I go like this, oh, your name's Sam? Oh, pleasure to meet you, Sam. Oh, Sam, just want to ask you a quick question, that's all. If you're to die today, are you 100% sure that you go to heaven? No, says Sam. Okay. Well, you know, the Bible says for Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says everyone has sinned. And you notice what happened automatically, right? I jumped to all that soul winning stuff at class number two. You saw how natural that was. You saw how the person would be listening and I'd catch them in. It's not like, oh, when can I introduce the subject? Oh, when can I introduce the subject? No. What's really important is this. What's really important is this is the intro where you catch them, see? And then when you ask them this question, once you ask them the question and they respond no, you caught them, hook, line, and sinker. And at that point, you keep yakking your mouth and you don't stop. Never ask any question, never pause. Once you do that, then you give them an opportunity to say, oh, you know, right now I'm not interested. Okay? You need to remember class number two, right? Once, you're, once you enter the foothold of Romans 3.23, once you pass this question and they answer, nonstop talk, don't give them a chance. The only time you ask them the question is the questions that I wrote at the last class. That's it. But in the meantime, you want to catch them. Now, I've gotten people who ask questions at class number two. And even uh, I had some people here, too. They asked me these questions. Well, what if a person says that I'm not a sinner? Or they might bring a tough question in the middle of your soul winning. Or they might not give you an answer that you'd hope for. Or let's say you said if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And the person says, oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then... Your concern is, well, what do I do after that, right? The simple answer is this. Don't worry about that right now. You're not going out soul winning right now. You're going to go out soul winning eventually. I'm training you right now all this to ingrain in your head. That's the point. 
Why do I want this ingrained in your head? Because I want you to practice it. I'm going to give you guys a chance to practice it through audio. So you're going to be doing it three times a week, three times per day. That's how you're going to be doing it. So nine times total throughout the week. Because I want you to, uh, my point is, I want you to say all of this like it's so memorized in your head that naturally you'll know what to say. Because when you start doing this in person, all of this stuff you forget. And you jumble and you go, which one's which? And then, oops, I did Revelation 21, 8 instead of Romans 5, 8. And see, you, uh, and then you switch things back and forth. You don't know what's next after that. So the point is, don't worry about what people are going to say and ask. Worry about that later. Right now, the point is, memorize this whole cotton picking thing. That's the goal. The goal is, you're going to memorize this like word for word so that when you're practicing and you're speaking in the audio, it just comes out like you're a like a computer, blah, 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 oh, blah, 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 oh, I know, blah, blah, blah. And if you have this mindset that, oh, I already know, so I'm going to, uh, blah, 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 good. You might say, why? Because I want it to be like so ingrained in your head that you're thinking, oh, I already know what's the next part. I want you to do that because when you're at the moment where you're talking to a person, you get scared, nervous, or you don't know what to say. But because in your brain, your unconscious brain, practice it practiced it so many times that the brain was forced to say, oh, I already know what's next, blah, 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 blah. It's going to come out like that, oh, blah, 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 to the person. See, that's why this thing, all, uh, worry right now about memorizing this everything, okay? Exactly like this. All right, that's the intro. Now you know how to catch a person, see? When you're doing street preaching and tracking, it's a little different. What you're doing is that uh, you're passing out free comics on the streets. So then you go, oh, hi, here's a free comic for you. Oh, hi, here's a free comic for you. Oh, hi, here's a free comic for you. And after you give them the free comic, then you ask them the question. Oh, by the way, I just want to ask you a quick question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? And then the person will say no, and then you caught him. So that's how you do street preaching and tracking. You just pass out free comics to a bunch of people. Here's a free comic for you, free comic. And then with one person where you feel like the timing is right or you know the person's walking slower or you think you can get this person, especially at a stoplight, a pedestrian stoplight, right? They stop and they receive the track from you. You can take that chance and say, oh, here's a free comic for you. Oh, by the way, just want to ask you a quick question, that's all. If you're to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? No. Oh, okay. Well, you know, the Bible says blah, 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 and then you go. You caught them, all right? So that's how you can do street preaching and tracking. Yes, sir. Oh, oh that, that wasn't a question? Okay, I thought that was a question. Sorry, yeah. If any of you have a question, if I keep yakking and I don't uh, give you a chance to ask, the reason why is because I'm trying to get a point across first, all right? So I just want to give a heads up in case. Just a heads up in case. Okay. Conclusion. Now, remember, in our last class, I taught you Romans 10.9, right? And then after you read Romans 10.9, you tell them, do you believe everything you've heard so far in the gospel? They'll say yes. And then you go, okay. Then all you have to do is say that to God to get saved. That's it. Now, what do you do after that, right? You've showed them the whole gospel. How do you conclude? Wrap it out. Wrap it up. Catch that fish. What you do then is this. In conclusion, what you do after that is simply tell them this. So all you have to do is say it to God. Because remember, this was the part that you need to get them to do, right? Say that they believe the gospel. Now, this is an important line. In less, in less than 15 seconds. That is extremely important. That way you can get the person to say it. A lot of times people don't want to say it. Why? Because they think that it requires, uh, it requires a lot of their time and moment. It's not very simple to do, etc. No, you want to make it so easy and simple where it's like, no, it's just less than 15 seconds and we're done. That's all you have to say. So I'll have to say it to God in 15 seconds. And then what you do is 
How about it? Would you be willing? To say to God that you believe the gospel now that's one now number two is that you would you be willing to say to God that you believe the gospel Here's an important line. I'll even help you say it to God. All you have to do is repeat after me. And then repeat again. It will only take 15 seconds. Like make a promise. Like this is so quick. All right. What's important about number two is that I'll even help you say it to God. All you have to do is just repeat after me. That sounds simple, right? Because that's how you're going to get the person to say it to God. The person might say, say it to God. Well, I don't know. And then, But when he hears that, all he has to do is repeat after you. And all he hears that it takes less than 15 seconds. What do you think the person is going to do? He's going to follow along with you. He'll say yes. Now, remember, you're saying this all at once. Okay? You're not giving a pause moment. You're saying all of this at once. So p combine all this together and make it so persuasive. All right. Maybe you should look at yourself in the mirror and see if you can persuade yourself to do it. Okay. That would be good advice. So look at yourself in the mirror. Try to act this out. Or this can you can also do this as the introduction too. In your introduction that I taught you how to uh, get the person to introduce them the gospel. So with introduction and conclusion, you can look at yourself in a mirror and then start talking with this pattern and see if you can even persuade yourself to follow along. If looking at a mirror just makes you lose confidence <laughs> and makes you slip up more, then I highly discourage looking at yourself in a mirror, okay? Don't do that. Just you yourself practice this consistently, consistently. Okay, let me give you an example. Look how, look how I can catch the person. Look at my demeanor. After I show them Romans 10.9, so remember class number two I taught you, right? Okay, Romans 10.9, yada, 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 etc. Okay, so did you believe everything you've heard in the gospel so far? The person says yes. Okay, then all you have to do is say it to God. Now I come to the conclusion. Okay, so all you have to do is say it to God, and it takes less than 15 seconds. How about it? Would you be willing to say it to God that you believe the gospel? Would you be willing to say to God that you believe the gospel? I'll even help you. I'll even help you say it to God. And all you have to do is repeat after me. And it'll take less than 15 seconds. That's it. Just 15 seconds. You just repeat after me. And we're done. What do you think the person's going to do? See, the person it gets them to naturally say yes. So use these lines. Make it persuasive. Make it persuasive where a person can follow you. And then when you do that, you get them to say the prayer. Now, the prayer is found in the back of our chick tracks. But what I'll do is that I will give the prayer here, okay? So number four, now you say the prayer. And then you're done. You caught the soul, you got him or her saved, all right? So you want to do the prayer. Now, the thing is this, is that when the person is going to say the prayer, so remember this line. After number three, okay, remember this part now. After number three, you're giving them the pause moment where they're going to say yes or no, right? 
Once the person says yes, then you're going to say the prayer. But before you say the prayer, you need to tell them this. Okay, so I'm going to... give you the words to repeat but remember now this is extremely important because people we don't want people to think repeating a prayer saves them and I hope you all realize that too repeating a prayer doesn't save you so you gotta tell them this but remember Repeating these words don't save you. Or let's say repeating this prayer. That would be better. That way they can see that prayer doesn't save them. Repeating this prayer doesn't save you. It's you telling God or saying to God, right? Because remember, we mentioned say, you have to say it to God. It's you telling or saying to God, you believe. See? So stress on belief. You believe the gospel all right so you want to stress that okay so you tell them this it's you telling saying to God you telling or saying to God that you believe the gospel that saves you and then after that then you say, okay, here we go. Repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, and then etc. All right, so I'm going to erase this part. I hope you remember that. It's important to stress this line. So I don't want people to think that when we do witnessing, we're not doing this like, you know, false conversions. We're, you notice I'm very careful. See, I cover every issue. I make sure that the soul winning is thorough. But I also do in a way where it's not dry, where it's not complicated. And what I get very disgusted with people on the internet, and I've gotten some people who also uh, cried about this too, is that these nitpicky, wicked, I mean, I think some of them are just wicked, that, that, would, that they would be so technical and nitpicky that, oh, this person doesn't give the gospel right, this person doesn't give the gospel right, blah, 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 and then, you know, oh, they're doing a prayer, and oh, you know, it's just this, and oh, you know, you got to stress more on this part and that part. I, I get disgusted with that. Because when you tell them this kind of stuff, then how will a person who watches that video be able to witness to somebody after that? You ever non notice why you scare away people when you talk to somebody how to get saved? Because you don't make it natural, comfortable, easy for them. You act so theologically nitpicky. All right. Now, of course, right doctrine is correct, but there is a difference with teach standing for right doctrine and being so technical and nitpicky. I don't like that. That is, that is the disgusting attitude. You're not going to win anybody like that. So I showed you I was very careful in right doctrine. You know this, right? I showed you that we don't overlook anything so that we don't make a false conversion. But I also taught you in a way where it makes it comfortable natural, not nitpicky and technical to a person. All right, now I'm going to give you the prayer, and then uh, we'll review our lessons on sin and faith very briefly, very briefly. So good news is that some of you who've fallen behind on that teaching sin and faith, I give you a chance actually to catch up a bit, okay? So that's the good news. All right, so here's the prayer you can use. You can use the back of the chick track. The back of the chick track has it. Or you can say it this way. Dear God, I repent as a sinner I believe G 
Jesus is God, who died, buried, and resurrected. Oh, by the way, when you read, use these words, use it three at a time. That's very important, or very few at a time. Why? Because a person's not going to remember everything you said. I mean, some of you who got saved in our church when I gave you the words to repeat, did I go, dear God, I repent as a sinner, and I believe. If I said it that way, some of you during church service, you would go, blah, 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 what, 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 pastor, what, I, I just lost my salvation. Slow down right there, right? <laughs> what did I, uh, some of you who got saved when, at our church when I gave you guys the gospel, you notice how I did it? I went, dear God, and then pause, giving you a chance to say it. I repent. As a sinner, I believe. And then when you come to like harder words like this one, resurrected, maybe just say this one time, resurrected. Don't say buried and resurrected because a person might not say that. You can say died, buried, and resurrected. So with a, long, with a complicated word, make it like even easier. Just say that alone or you can use and resurrected, doesn't matter. And resurrected, so his blood can wash away. Okay, I'm going to do it this way. These hyphens will give you a chance to pause. That'll be easier. Can wash away my sins. So I only trust in the blood alone. To save me not my good works save me from hell in Jesus name I pray, amen. Now, was this shorter than 15 seconds? You betcha. Let me give you an example. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. So his blood can wash away my sins. So I only trust in the blood alone to save me, not my good works. Save me from hell in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So you notice how fast that was. It doesn't take as long as you think. Now, I don't know, maybe maybe it was a little longer than 15 seconds, I don't know. <laughs> but you notice that it doesn't take as long as you think. It's very short, it's very fast. So I will leave this prayer right here for you guys. Now, once you get them to say that, then they are saved, they are done. So this is how simple salvation is. It's very simple, anyone can get saved. Now, remember, isn't the gospel supposed to be simple? It's not supposed to be a work. It's supposed to be simple. So when you're witnessing to somebody, don't make it hard. Make it simple. A lot of people, they get so much stuffed with theological stuffiness and nitpicky attitude, they make the, the gospel hard for a person to understand. So how can a person believe to get saved if he's having trouble understanding? And you make it hard. So make the delivery easy. And, you know, uh, that doesn't mean you have to be doctrinally wrong. I made it doctrinally sound. But I didn't have this rigid attitude of exact correctness where I made it difficult for a person. Make it so loose and natural and easy that a person can do it. Okay, so that's how you do witnessing. Now, you all have to practice this. Don't worry about, well, what if a person says, well, I don't want to pray. I, pray. I don't want to repeat after you. Or... You know, they ask these questions or they interrupt my soul winning or a person.
person is not going to naturally say yes, yes, yes to every question that I ask. So what am I going to do? Hey, don't worry about that. That's later. Okay, that is later. What you need to do is know the exact method how to do the soul winning. And then it becomes so mechanical and ingrained in your head that you're going to go blah, blah, blah naturally. That's the point. Okay, now concerning our lessons on sin and faith, I hope that some of you have listened to the audio. So let's first talk about faith. Now, I hope you realize the design now of how I teach my lessons, you notice. If you have Alvin Douglas's book, you notice the pattern that I did it. So what I will do is that I will give a chance to people online. I usually don't do this, but I'll kind of spoil you, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you like a touch of my notes. So here's one example on sin. I don't know if people can see that clearly. But you'll see how I organized it in outline form. You can pause and rewind. And then you can pass this down. That way you can get an idea how to write your notes. You'll notice that I say the next section is, the next section is, the verse to turn to, the verse to turn to. Why did I do it that way? Because it's... It's designed in this format. If you do that, it'll be easy. Yeah, good handwriting, mm -hmm. Pastor. Oh, thank you, brother. <laughs> okay, so in faith, we've reviewed our lessons on sin and on faith. So we're going to review this very briefly. That way you can get an idea. All right, thank you so much, brother. So we're going to talk about uh, sin here because some of you are still holding my notebook on, on my paper on faith. So... <laughs> On sin, the first section we covered was the definition of sin, right? And then in the definition of sin, I gave you a definition from the dictionary, and I gave you a definition from the Bible. And from the definition of the Bible, I gave you three different definitions. Sin is an act, sin is a state, sin is a nature. And I gave you verses on each of them. The next section we covered on sin was the origin of sin. So we realized that the beginning of sin started with Satan. But the thing is, is that even though it began with Satan, sin is birthed through lust. We saw that in James chapter 1. So, that we, so we got to understand that sin is not just there created by God. It is formed from man's man or some being's free choice. That's how sin is originated. We also saw that the origin of sin in our world was through Adam. And we also saw that in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 through 6 that all these steps of actions in Genesis 3 prove the or how sin is originated. And that matches with James 1, how lust conceives through sin. I also talked about the manifestations of sin. So there are many different... So when you see these words in the Bible, these are the manifestations of sin. Transgression, you saw that word before in the Bible. I gave you what it means, and I gave you the verse. Iniquity, I gave you the... Definition and the verse. Error. I gave you a definition and a verse. Same thing with the other uh, five. Missing the mark, trespass, lawlessness, debt, and unbelief. I also went through the lo uh, list of sins. Now that part, that section was very important, list of sins. Why? Because it gives you an idea what God considers to be sin and what he thinks are serious ones. So I listed them out to you. The best verses that covered a whole bunch of lists was Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 17. It gave the Ten Commandments, right? Idolatry, cursing, Sabbath breaking, disrespect to parents, murder, adultery, stealing, lying, covetousness. Uh, the Sabbath breaking, though, as you already learned, that does not apply to Christians today. So I taught you that at a different lesson. I'm not going to expound on that on this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 listed a lot of really dark sins, including sexual ones. So some people ask, you know, what's wrong with, I've heard people asking me this question, which should be common sense. What's wrong with masturbation? And some guys who act a little effeminate, well, what's wrong with that? Well, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 gave the list. It gave the list of the effeminacy, masturbation, drunkards, revilers, and extortioners. Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 20, 31 gave a list of sins, including homosexuality. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 8, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23. These verses gave a whole bunch of list of sins that a Christian shouldn't commit. It's a total of over 50 sins with many variations of each one. Now, I, in the next section, I told you that sins cannot be hidden. Now, I gave you two ugly verses that your sin, it is very certain that your sin will be found out. And not just your sin, but you yourself, the sinner, will be found out. So that was ugly. The next section, we talked about the death from sin. Now, this is doctrinally important. Sin affected all states of man. Man consists of body, soul, and spirit, right? All three affected by the power of sin. I taught you that with the body, it was physical death. The body turns to dust. The spirit, spiritual death. If you are not saved in Jesus Christ, right now you're spiritually dead. Uh, eternal death, which is also called the second death. That's the soul, burning in hell forever. The next section we talked about was how sin, I think, I don't know why I crossed this out, but uh, did I teach about how sin affected everybody? I'm not sure. If I didn't, okay, thank you. If I didn't, then that was in a different paper then. Okay. I talked about the remedy for sin. So in the remedy for sin, I talked about that the blood is the solution for sin, and that those verses are so important. I hope you wrote them down, 1 John 1, 7, Ephesians 1, 7. And confessing sins to plead the blood, that's the solution for your sins. 1 John 1, 9 and verse 7 is a basic everyone should know. If you all don't know that, now you know. Next time if a person mentions 1 John 1, 7 and 9 about confessing sins and God is faithful to forgive, you better not forget that. That is a basic lesson. All right, faith, and then we'll call it a night. In faith, I taught you in the first section the definition of faith, the definition of faith. And I told you that basically faith is believing without seeing at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now, this is extremely important in definition of faith. The reason why there are so many false converts is that they have a head belief, not a heart belief. So this is a very important section I hope you remembered in the lesson of faith. I told you the distinction with that, and I even gave you verses the difference. The devils also believe and tremble, right, at James 2.19. So that's a head belief. But their heart doesn't actually, will not act upon the believing, see? So I gave you an easy example about crossing a wooden bridge. A bridge, you believe that it'll hold you up. That's what you know in your head. But do you believe it enough that you'll walk on the wooden bridge? See, so it's believing where you act upon it. And then I stressed Acts 16.31, the importance of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Not in. It's not head. It's acting upon it, the belief. I also talked about in the next section, the source of faith, the source of faith, and I gave you the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I gave you three verses on that. So God is the source of faith through the Trinity. The Bible is the source of faith. Prayer is the source of faith. And not only that, the Holy Spirit sometimes gives you a natural gift to believe more. It's When you enter college, that's where you doubt more. <laughs> When you grow into an adult, not a kid, that's where you doubt more, become more critical-minded. So don't doubt the gift that the Holy Spirit gives to some of you. If you're children, that's a gift that the Holy Spirit gave to you to naturally believe on Jesus Christ and not like some college students who lost the gift. <laughs> the next section is the object of faith. So the object of faith, which is absolutely important, is the Word of God and Jesus Christ. So uh, you got to realize this. People say they do not have faith to get saved. But faith is not what saves you, you got to understand. It's Jesus who saves you. They believe that their faith, see that? And what they mean by their faith is their own, not specifically the Bible, what it says. Not on Jesus himself. So what do they mean by faith? I don't have enough faith to get saved. Ask them, what do you mean by faith? It's something they believe in. Their own fairy tale fantasy, not actually what you showed them from the Bible, not upon Jesus Christ. 
So you got to realize faith is not the thing that saves. It's the means that gets you saved. It's not the source. It's the means. Faith is the means where you get saved. The object of the faith is upon what the Bible says. This is how you get saved. Upon Jesus Christ, I'm trusting only on him for my salvation. The results of faith is the next section. Now, the results of faith, I gave you so many things. If you have faith, these are the blessings that accompany faith. And I hope that you wrote them down and even looked at those verses. One, we know that God exists. Two, we get saved. Three, we receive Christ. Four, we are justified. Five, we become the children of God. Six, we become sanctified. Seven, we are kept by faith. That's eternal security. That's awesome. Uh, eight, we have rest. Very true. When you have faith, you don't have to worry about you, you, you losing your house or going into debt. We have rest. We gain blessings. I hope you didn't miss that out. If you lose faith recently, that's why you haven't experienced a lot of blessing in your life. Ten, we have power. There's a lot of power in faith, you got to understand. When you have faith, you can even remove a mountain. I showed you a verse on that one. Ten benefits, results of faith. All right, the next section of is reasons for losing faith. Reasons for losing faith. And I gave you five main reasons, which are very interesting. Seeing is believing. Sight. That was the first one. And I showed you a very important thing here that you can use as a powerful argument against atheists. They can't believe because they have to see, right? That's their problem. So how you demolish an atheist with this one is that you give them certain examples. Like when they buy a can of oil, they just buy it by faith without actually looking inside and seeing if there's oil inside, right? They just believed it by faith. People uh, who ride a taxi, the taxi driver believes by faith the person's going to pay him, even though the person can just bail out of the car any time, right? Now, why is it that they naturally have faith without seeing it? See, that's why no one can be an atheist. Everyone has faith, and I mean even an atheist too. They have faith. They never saw everything before. Why would they believe in that? Because there's enough reason to believe. That's the same thing with God. Even though we don't see God, we don't see all the things that happen in the Bible, there's enough reason, a lot of logic and evidence that backs it up. That's why we can believe in those things without seeing. You see that? So that's a very important foundational argument that will help you immensely when you talk with many people who don't believe there is a God or who are atheists or even in your own life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 is a very powerful verse to use, that there is reason to your faith. Uh, the second one is fear. Obviously, when you fear, you lose faith. I gave you a verse on that one. Suffering. Oh, my goodness. So many Christians, I see them don't come back to church or quit on Jesus Christ, turn to the world because of suffering. So that's another reason. The, another one why you lose your faith is reason. Now, I explained the problem here. Remember, uh, I told you that your faith has enough reason. But even though your faith has enough reason, reason itself can be the attack against your faith. So that sounds contradicting. And if you listen to that lesson, I explained, I cleared up the controversy. The controver How I cleared up the controversy is this, is that, look, there's enough logic and reason to your faith, right? So why can't you trust everything that God does that seems unreasonable, that doesn't make sense to you? Can't you believe in him on that? See, when you're going through times where God, he does not do it the way you do things, right? It always defies how you think that makes sense. And God does it the opposite sometimes deliberately to teach you a lesson. No, that's a good plan, but I got a better plan. I'm going to do it this way. And then your reason, your mind's thinking, well, that don't make sense. Why did you do it that way? Why did you do it that way? But the reason why you can still believe on him doing something that defies your sense of reason is that He's proven with enough reason and evidence already that he is real. The Bible is true. I mean, you got to think about this. The prophecies in this book number more than 200. The odds of it happening is one out of 10 to the 
114th power or something like that. That's more, that's blindfolding yourself and picking one electron out of the entire mass of the universe. Okay, what are the odds of that happening? So God already proved with enough reason, evidence, that you can believe on him and his word. So anything else that defies your sense of reason, what makes sense to you, you can have faith on it. So that's why reason can be the conflicting thing to your faith. See that? Because your reason does not go with God's sense of reasoning. The last one is truth. Truth. So how is truth a hindrance to believing? Because people don't want the truth. It's that simple. People, they don't like to hear they're going to burn in hell forever. So you ever argued with an atheist? And the, the number one thing why an atheist would deny God is an emotional reason that they don't like to hear. Basically, God is unfair that all these sufferings and bad things have to happen. What That's their reason for them not believing in God? See, it's more of an emotional reason. They don't want to know the truth. Because let's assume God is unfair. I'm not saying he is, but let's assume he is unfair. Does that overthrow truth and fact? Let's say God is an unfair God. He allows suffering to happen. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you burn in hell. Well, I'll tell you one thing, whether he's unfair or not, I don't want to burn in hell because I know it's real, so I'm going to get saved in Jesus Christ. See? So the thing is this, is that people, they just don't want the truth. That's why. So because they don't like the truth, they'll reject it. They find every excuse to reject it. They love their sin or they don't want to sacrifice something. That's one thing I learned. That's why they don't want to believe. So sometimes truth can be the hindrance to your faith. Okay, so that, those are our lessons, and uh, your next homework assignment is not going to be the audios, okay? It's going to be actually practicing, practicing. So all of you online, I want you to do this. Everything that you've learned, so remember, I want you to do introduction, the whole soul winning thing that I taught you at class number two, and the conclusion. So introduction, conclusion, I taught you at class number three. And then class number two, all that soul winning stuff. I want you to do all those things. And to these people here in this room, this is what I want you to do. Now, this is going to be incredibly annoying. Okay, No one likes this homework assignment, but trust me, the more robotic we do this, the more habitual we do this, it's going to get ingrained in your head. I want you to do it three times, three times in one day. All right, you're not going to separate out the days three times in a row, in a row. Because that way, when you do it in a row, when you do the second and third time, it becomes more fresh. It becomes like, oh, so you know how to handle it, okay? Now, I'm going to make it easy for you. Usually, I did it with Stan and Jack. I said three times a week. But I'm going to give you two times a week. Two times a week. So, so that means any day, okay? Pick any two days you want any two days you want. But remember this, in each day, so one day, one day, you have to do it three times. And I mean three times. Don't, you've got to do it three times. You know why? Because that way it's fresh in your head, okay? If you do it one time and then you do it the next day, the second time, you forgot everything. Three times, one day two days, any two days you want to do it. So basically, how many times in total then? What does that mean? How many times in total? That means in total you're doing it six times. Yeah. All right, six times. But I don't want you to go one on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. No, I don't want you to do that. All right. I want you to do three times on that one day. Now, here's the thing is that I want you to look through the paper and try to make it as perfect as you can. Try to make it as perfect as you can. If you slip up after one time, don't worry. Just keep talking, okay? If you fumble, just go blah, 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 and then just jump to Romans 5, 8 or something, okay? The reason why is that way you can keep it fresh. And then after you finish that one time, so let's say here's my first time, and then I'm talking, 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 and then Romans 5, 9, I stumbled, and I didn't know what to say. So then I just continue talking, and when I finished, then it's fresh on my mind where I made the mistake on. And naturally, I feel comfortable about I know which areas that I did well on. 
And then before I do my second time, I look through my paper and I go, okay. And then boom, I do the second time. Second time sounds better. Uh, some mistakes here and there. And the third time, I do better. I still make mistakes though after the third time. Remember that. You're not going to ace in one day. You're going to ace probably after two weeks or three weeks. All right? That's when you're going to ace. So if you make mistakes in between, that's normal, all right? Sometimes it's going to take you a month or two months. I've had some people doing that. The point is we're going to keep doing this, doing this, where it's so drilled where you're going to get it, all right? So that will be your homework assignment is to review these things. And then in our next discipleship class, what we're going to do is going to be something very different. What we're going to do is that we're going to actually practice soul winning here. Okay, so that will be the next class. The next class, we're actually going to practice soul winning with each other. Don't worry about messing up because I promise you, 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 and you will mess up in soul winning. So don't get nervous and feel like, oh, what do I have to say? What do I do? And blah, blah. Look, I, I want to make this easy for you guys, all right? That's the point. But I want you to be faithful in your assignment. That way it can be easy for you, all right? So be faithful in them so it can be easy for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For the truth of thy word and tonight's lesson, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, 
www.bbcenglish.org and click on the resources link over there and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.